RugbyRenegade.com, the number one online strength and conditioning program for rugby. Are you ready to get bigger, stronger, fitter, and faster and dominate your opposition? Welcome to the Rugby Renegade Podcast, where we build machines. Hello and welcome to episode three of the Rugby Renegade Podcast. My name's Jamie Bain and today I'm going to interview Marlon Devonish. Um, speed expert and Olympic gold medalist. Uh, it's a great interview for anyone interested in improving their speed for rugby. Um, just loads of things you can take away uh, and a good insight into uh, Marlon's coaching philosophy. Um, and it's just great to chat to someone who's performed at such a high level and, and now is coaching. I've worked with Marlon for, for three years now um, as a consultant for speed in rugby but um, he's also worked with QPR and football and um, you know countless other athletes and sprinters so have a listen let us know what you think Hi Marlon welcome to the Rugby Renegade podcast Hi good to meet you uh, It's great to have you here um, obviously talking a lot about sort of speed development and, and stuff for rugby with, with your background but let's start um, you know you're an Olympic gold medalist um, You've been an athlete for over 20 years, isn't it? Just tell us a bit about how you got into athletics and, and some of the um, you know, big performances you've had in your career. Yes, so um, I've been involved with uh, in athletics for 20 years. For the last 16 of those years, I competed at a world-class level, uh, medalled over the 200 metres and the 4x1 relay. So I competed in European Championships, Commonwealth Games, went to four Commonwealth Games. Uh, I am World Indoor Champion back in 2003. And as you said, what I'm most well known for is the gold back in 2004 and being part of the strike for that win gold by 0.01 of a second, which is now, what, 12 years ago. So a long time ago now. Crikey, yeah. But obviously that, that's, you know, one of the great things that... Uh you can achieve in sport an Olympic gold medal that's that's great yes and uh, off the back of that so uh, so towards the end of my career last say three or four years you start thinking about your future and uh, the natural progression for me was to get involved um, into into sport and get involved in athletics initially so I did that so I went out to Pennsylvania worked with a relay squad GB squad on a, a consultancy basis and and really enjoyed that and then uh, got the opportunity to do some work with you guys at Gloucester and came at the perfect time really. I wanted to challenge myself in a different capacity rather than um, being in, well, as I said to you, 20 years of athletics, very proud, love my sport, but I wanted a different challenge and this opportunity came, came up with working with Gloucester Rugby Club so I took it with both hands and been there for now three years. Yeah, and it's been obviously been great having you here with us. Um, now, and you've got a unique, um, you know, experience having obviously competed as a sprinter. You, you coach sprinters. You've coached football as well at QPR. Um, what What are the sort of differences you see when you compare those sort of athletes to rugby players? So um, I had a perception of what a rugby player was like: big, thick, strong, slightly Neanderthal, but. <laughs> I've always had a mutual respect for professional sports people. So there's a, there was always a strong respect. That respect grew massively over the first three or four months with the workload and what the guys put their bodies through uh, week in and week out. So I have a newfound respect for what the guys do in rugby. And there's no hiding places in rugby. So um, uh, secondly would be the the culture of the game. You the impacts and what they have. So the impacts they have is just so far from what I've done as an athlete. There's no, it's not, the closest thing I've had is the bat and hit me in the back of my head. So it's, just, <laughs> it's not, it's not conducive to what the guys do in, in the world of rugby. So that was uh, a massive understanding for me. And you can understand why you need to build up the muscle bulk around the, the, the athletes so they can sustain those impacts. And another thing, I think in regards to speed and thinking on a speed, put my speed coaching hat on, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the guys are frequency based. So what I mean by that, they, to get quicker, they spin and try and spin quicker, so move their legs quicker. And there's, two, there's a few other aspects that I don't think get tapped into with the stride length and understanding of stride length and uh, ground contact time. 
Grand Contact Time has a great relationship with the frequency. So you, it's all there, but I think that it's, it's, it's in the how that's done. And yeah. um, that was one of the things I noticed when I first got involved. And uh, to be honest, that's in most team sports. Yeah. And, then, uh, and I think there's a lack of understanding because people think stride length means slow. And actually, if you look at Usain Bolt, who runs 100 metres, uh, granted he's a tall athlete, I think 6'4". Um, he runs 100 metres in 41 strides. I used to do it in 46 strides. And if you put a rugby player in that same remit over 100 metres, it wouldn't surprise me they're hitting 50 55 meters, 55 steps, which is uh, a lot of wastage. I'm not suggesting you try and do what you, Saint Bolt, does or what I do, but there's things that need to be put in place, and that can be put in place that could prolong the speed and increase their speed endurance uh, over the 80 minutes of a game. Yeah, and I guess they're the the kind of fundamentals of, of sprinting and running mechanics. Yeah, and obviously, there's no one other than yourselves and other sprinters who who understand that better. Exactly. So when you that being said when you look at a rugby player you start working with them um how do you go about improving their speed for for rugby so acceleration is a massive and a key aspect from static or rolling is a massive part of uh the rugby game so if you could do that better than somebody else you can evade someone quicker you can get a try line and and speed is a huge aspect what I think is misunderstood, because I know there's a lot of research saying that a rugby player or team sports generally do not hit or don't hit full velocity or maximum, uh, full flight mechanics or top end speed, whatever you want to call it. But having an understanding of the mechanics and the technical aspects of full flight mechanics and rehearsing that enhances your acceleration. So there's Apart, if you're going to exclude the start blocks, which is not necessarily in the world of rugby, so you have your acceleration phase, then your transition, which is literally the movement from acceleration chest down up into full flight mechanics. So if you don't understand how to get to full flight mechanics, you're, you're second guessing your acceleration and then transition, which is probably the hardest part, in my opinion, in getting right to then enhance your top end. So if you have an understanding, even a basic understanding, your acceleration will will excel massively. So that's something that I've, I tried to um, implement at Gloucester. Uh, again, it takes time, the learning curve, because there's so many different aspects of the game of rugby. The learning curve can't be as steep as I'd like it to be. So uh, uh, it's, it's a progression over a period of time. So now we're getting to that point now, I can really start homing in and pushing on that top end mechanics. Yeah, definitely. And I think sometimes people, when you say speed and, and S&Cs would see speed as that top end speed and we talk about acceleration as something different, but in rugby you've got speed of movement of all the different skills you take part in, you know, whether it's acceleration or not. It's, I think speed is kind of different for different sports, if that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, completely. Yeah. 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 So talking about acceleration, um, as you said, it's hugely important for rugby. Um, what methods do you use to improve that with the guys? So uh, I use, for my athletic background, uh, I use uh, m lots of drills. Uh, I, I, al I always try and make it as clear as day. This is what you're doing and this is what needs to be done. And I use various different stories and cues to illustrate that, which gives the, the player a completely clear understanding, right, this is so much better for me to do this. If I can do this in the match, I can do this in the game. Uh, it'll have a massive effect and it's, it's clear as day so I've, I've tried to really home in on that you might have heard some of my stories and what I say before we do an actual um, drill and how it should be done is of critical importance so that's uh, one of the things that I work on and then once I've, I'm happy with what I see let me go and do some sprints and try to have that focus implemented in, in the sprints and I try to try to keep to two maximum I rarely tap into three that would be someone who's really quite good at their mechanics. That would so it's usually one cue and two cue per per rep, per repetition, and just keep re repeating that with the time I have. And the more that that's, that becomes a subconscious thing, and then it's something they just do um, on the pitch uh, when they choose to, when they need to do it. Yeah, definitely. And and it's that um, it's that getting it 
getting it to the subconscious level is the goal really isn't it that's the difficult time that's for me that's the challenge in regards to my coaching and being able to make it stick uh, and it's, it's so so they they actually know when I'm not there and when they're on the pitch and when they're in training I don't want this to you don't want you to be thinking about techniques in training and in, in competition when you're competing on the pitch it's just too much thinking and amongst learning and the whole chess and the, the chaos of the game of rugby but in training you can still tap into right this run I'm going to focus on this and 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 and, and apply that and hopefully well Within time, we still get. In the time, you get, you get, you get, you get results. Yeah. Cool. So, um, obviously, a big important factor is is strength training. How do you see that um, is best used to improve speed? Well, there's many aspects. Of your first, you've got literally, if you you're stronger, you've got more strength in your body, then you can those impacts become more tolerable, and then. Without that strength, that true strength, and I'm, I'm asking you to increase your stride length, that requires strength and then power. So without the strength, you can't have the power to do that. So it, yeah. it's critical. It's, it's, it's of massive paramount that it's that it's worked on a lot and it's maintained. Key key thing. It's maintained throughout the season. So uh, one, you know, when you feel strong, you feel powerful, you feel confident. Uh, it's not just. I try to look at it on a holistic point. I think I, I I draw a lot from my experiences of competing at the highest level, and there's certain things I, that once you become familiar with, there's like a blueprint of things that I always said, right, I must have these things in place, and I try to implement that and plant some seeds with the players, and so they, so when again making it stick, so I have all these silly cues sometimes, and but they're rememberable. You remember them, so then when they're not quite feeling they can tap into it quite easily when I'm not there so it gives them so they can rehearse that for longer with the limited time we have yeah so in terms of uh, like strength lifts um, what are some of the ones you did back in, in your sort of competing and training career and, and give us give us some numbers yeah okay so um, I would deadlift I deadlift about 200 plus kilos yeah. Uh, for maybe three or four reps, and I probably do maybe four or five sets of that. Yeah. And what uh, sort of body weight were you at for these uh, as well? Just... That body weight, I'd be so this is more so in so give you an idea. So in the winter is where I'd be bulking up and I'd put a lot of weight. I'd say a lot of weight and I'd put on. So uh, my racing weight was 78 kilos, okay. and I'd be at about 82, 83 kilos training in the winter, mm-hmm. and I'd lose the five kilos. And try and stay as close to maintaining that kind of strength. Yeah. Of course, the reps would reduce. Uh, so power cleans, we didn't do full cleans. So if we did full full movement, it would be very early on in the season. So yeah. literally, you're stepping into the gym pre-season. You're doing it then. Um, uh, my cleans, I did uh, 132.5, which is important. The 0.5 is important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's for a power clean. I was weighing about 80 kilos at the time. Yeah, that's crazy. So, yeah, so there's... Uh, I, that's I just something you rehearse and you practice and practice. The more you do it, the better you get. And it, it had for me, I had ability to cross that over onto the pitch. Oh, sorry, onto the track. <laughs> I'm in the world of rugby now. I don't think about athletics anymore. But, yeah... Um, <laughs> other exercises there's various different uh, specific exercises that will probably take too long to explain over the phone yeah. that I did uh, and uh, again trying to implement it with uh, the boys but let's keep uh, keeping it simple to start with and hoping to build those new exercises and make it a bit more complex and a bit more challenging uh, in the future yeah so talking about obviously you won't be able to explain a lot of those exercises but one of the common things and the and the different things that I guess a lot of people won't have seen with sort of basic strength exercises like your squats, your cleans, and your deadlifts, is that you you kind of used um, a stretch shortening cycle under load. So, for instance, a simple one would be boys in a lunge position uh, where they're bounding off the off the front leg. So there was that stretch reflex, but they were at load in a, you know in a deep range of motion. Just sort of explain the the sort of theory behind that. Yeah, so um, I can't take ownership for that exercise. That's something I did with Dan Paff and Stuart McMillan. So you're yeah. talking about you drop into the lunge position. Is that the one you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, so it's a literal lunge. You've got the weight on your back and 
you stand stand tall and you drop into a lunge position the key thing is is to be completely completely static and have no lateral movement no leakage on your contact so it's well documented so if you're going to hit the floor if you're going to apply force to the ground it needs to be done in a stable as stable as possible to yeah. then get off the floor if you want to be quick at it so first if you have any um uh what's the word if you're unstable on that contact then your body has to stabilize first on the ground to then come off the ground yeah. so what you're trying to rehearse there is to drop down is it stiff massive is that the term you're looking for stiffness Sorry? stiff yeah massive recruitment yeah. yeah the stiffness and making sure you're completely locked and it's just a fixed position almost like a statue the word yeah. statue i want you to be in a statue then drop me back out of that and then we re hurt redoing again you so, do probably sets so you probably do a set of uh, normal lunges to start with and then you'll drop into that afterwards and there'll be more of a power up you know like on a power up on a Thursday that's what we do before we go into a match they're the things to get the body get the, everything recruiting everything firing as you want it to yeah. to then go out on the pitch and have the game of your life and is it more about sort of absorbing the energy being able to hold that you know biomechanically yeah. strong yeah. body position so and then you, you eventually start produce force yeah, you'll start, you'll, you, you would start, I start quite light first, so they get a feel of understanding what I'm trying to do, and talk them through that, and then you'd increase the weight and try and, you try to ramp up the weight, I would, and then yeah. if they can sustain that, it's just, you you get a real good pack perfect afterwards, uh, so your, uh, your post-activation potentiation stuff is, 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 is tied in with the plyometrics as well, so. Yeah, and, and talking about plyometrics, I think this is something that kind of gets confused a bit, and people sort of think plyometrics are just for power development, but it's also for kind of injury prevention and fitness. Sort of tell us a bit of your, your sort of theory on that in terms yeah, so, of sort of energy efficiency and things. Yeah, so um, so one of the sessions, so the power-up session we do on a Thursday, which is the, probably the biggest session, is more of a speed-orientated explosive session before we go out on the, on the following the, it'll be the Saturday. <laughs> yeah. yeah, get it right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there's a series of different types of plyometrics jumps that I try and um, implement in the session. So it's it's integrated into the weight session. So it's, it's the power section we talk about. So there's the horizontal jumps, which is obviously paramount, getting off the floor and coming down to the floor. How you do that is key. Uh, vertical. So, sorry, horizontal going up and down, obviously, going so you're going over the hurdles or you're jumping on top of a box, how you land. Uh, one of the cues I use is uh, a silent. So if you're silent, it, it improves your proprioception, so you're more of aware of the ground, so you're really anticipating the floor. So when you hit the floor, you're absorbing and you're not letting the floor come to you. So yeah. if you let the floor come to you, then you have to respond to come off, which is slow. So then um, it's one of the cues I use. Uh, and then the lateral movements. And one of the things I've seen in lateral movements, I've seen on many um, YouTubes and all the sorts of stuff, even at, down at the athletics track, is there's the lateral movement, but there's no displacement of moving from one, shifting the whole body out of um, it, one position into another. So you're trying to increase that displacement by... by um, shifting and being quick off the floor and reactive with the, to, uh, to prime that would be the horizontal jumps and the vertical jumps and being that yeah being able to cause a big displacement so you want to, you want to cause evasion you want to get out of the way not just to be able to dance on the toes which is more um it's just it's a basic move to be honest so i try to really make sure the emphasis on that is to really move out of the way, literally, in a yeah. very simple way of looking at it. And obviously that makes sense in rugby because you don't want to just catch the ball, do a little no. bit of footwork and then run into contact. You want to off offset your defender by him watching you and that you know, obviously that displacement and then yeah. get away from him. Exactly. Uh, so so I just so, so run on the spot, so, it's not gonna work. Yeah, exactly. So I make a really exactly. So I, I really make sure I keep a, di a distance between the coaches they're the coaches and they, they teach the art, the, um, the chaos of the game and the, and the set plays and uh, this, those type of skills I, I, I pay attention to. But uh, that's not my remit. That's not my that's not my strength. And it's not, it's not what I'm good at. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a rugby player. So I, I really try and work on those, those aspects that are key. So when they, it, it slots in nicely to the plays that, they, that they're trying to create. Yeah. So Marlon, as I said, you've worked with 
um, lots of different sprinters, footballers and, and rugby players as well as other athletes in your private work. Um, what do you think, looking at rugby players, is the biggest mistake they make when it comes to whether it's speed development or just S&C in general? Okay, um, let's have a think. So there's a few things. So frequency, I think I've mentioned that before. So uh, a team sport, so football, I see this in as well. And of course, in rugby, to get quicker, they focus on frequency alone. And frequency, of course, is a key part, but it's not the only aspect. And there's massive gains to be had. And it's quite it's taxing on the body because the nervous system can't sustain that and keep that um, frequency going over there, especially over 80 minutes. Mm. So then you, you just end up slogging the body then by just... So what you're trying to do is be moving in from A to B quickly, but more efficiently. Again, not trying to be like Usain Bolt or myself. Um, another aspect I'd talk about is uh, I've discovered more so is control of the pelvis is control so there's a lot of with that frequency you see a lot of anterior tilt of the pelvis so the pelvis is tilt so the belt buckle is pointing down yeah and um so then you that promotes spinning on the spot yeah and breaking and stabbing into the ground which means you're going you 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 you're generating all this force in the gym and the gym and the explosive off, off the plyometrics in the gym and then you're you're slowing yourself down by stabbing because your 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 pelvis is in an anterior tilted position and it's not conducive to speed so you want to be so if you can have control over that pelvis so when it's needed to open out into full flight mechanics or go through the transition which again in my opinion is one of the hardest things that's something that i really try and home in on and so that 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 pelvis is in a neutral position regardless of whether you're tilting forward or up so you've got that control of that pelvis and again um the full flight mechanics i think it's missing massively if you can so you can almost look at it uh, uh, probably a bad example would be a car if you have a car that runs 100 miles an hour then you make it go 120 miles an hour the chances are your acceleration is going to be increased you because of the more range you have of speed so uh, I think it's something that's not tapped into simply because the misunderstanding of how full, full flight mechanics and how to get there through transition into full flight mechanics because then you're saving your nervous system later so you can respond off the floor quicker which will enhance your speed which will change the way you do your ex- way you accelerate and uh, uh, and once you once you feel that you won't turn back because it feels so much easier and it looks, it looks, it can look slower, but the times indicate that you're moving quicker, and you can sustain and do that more often throughout the match. And you know what happens where the league is at the moment is so tight. Those just that, that that one try here and that one try there, and that little escape to the left or to the right and evasion is the difference between winning and losing. So, I yeah. think that's something that we really need to tap into and and um, want to do more actually at Gloucester. Yeah, and I think I think you touched on a point there. In terms of yeah, you're working to improve their speed firstly, but by improving that, um, you actually improve fitness because they're more efficient. Um, they're expending less energy with each foot contact. Um, they're they're not like say running on the spot. You know, chasing frequency. Every every um, step is dynamic and purposeful. Yeah, and, and that adds up a lot over the over the eighty minutes. So, yeah, and to know, add yeah, and to add to that, uh, the body's working more efficiently so the muscles are being developed in more efficiently which would then those smaller muscles that wouldn't have been working before are now working giving more support so you can with take those impacts a lot more there's so many different ways you can go at it yeah and um well and that, that's, that that's highlights what, injury prevention as well you know exactly if, if they're yeah. functioning properly they're, they're less prone to injury as well yeah 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 cool um marla i've got to ask you because i know the players from time to time will ask you for a little story but uh, you've raced against Usain Bolt. What, what's he like? So the Usain Bolt you see on TV, uh, on the BBC interview, and the laugh and the jokes you see is exactly the same Usain Bolt you see going through the call-up rooms underneath the stadium and in the warm-up track. You'll see all the banter, the smiles, and that's his persona. I couldn't do that personally. I needed to be quite focused. I had the banter probably. <laughs> um, to start with, but as I closer to my, as I came to the track, I needed to home in and concentrate on a few. And I had to, I had to focus, unless I, I, I couldn't do what Usain does. But he, he is 
an ass- massive asset to the sport. And I know for a fact he trains hard. Yeah. Trains very hard, and I, I, one of the things I talk about with with the boys, uh, or any of my clients actually, is you need to keep that bottom line as high as you possibly can. So those bad sessions you have, everybody has the bad sessions. You want that bad session to be cl- as close as possible to your best session in training, because yeah. then that discrepancy you, is small. If you can stay in that, that's where you're going to get your consistency. And then what happens over a period of time? depending on genetics and various other things, you will leap up to the next level. And then that will be, and then what was good before is now become average and then you're onto a new level. And that's, and you just keep doing that throughout your career and you'll get, you get, you get closer or, or get the performances you want and at least you can walk away from your sport a happy man. Yeah. I, I really like that because like you're, you're right, you're not always going to have brilliant sessions, but if you can make your, your bad sessions slightly better each time, um, it, and it's consistency over the long run, isn't it, that really gets you results? Yeah, without doubt. So that, that's the one thing I, from from um, personal experience. So as I said to you, it was 16 years I competed at world class level, and I medalled. I went to every major championship, and I can look back now. At the time, you don't really think about it, but I can look back now and tell you that it was the consistency. I just refused to let. Um, the bottom line go to a certain level and I knew what I needed to be at for me to be ex- successful and again I try and, with all my clients try and tap into that with them so that I can uh, so they can I feel at least half of what I've experienced in my sport yeah that's awesome um, Marlon thanks for, for taking the time to talk to us um, just quickly is there, is there anywhere where people can learn a bit more about you Twitter or yeah website? so um, I don't put too much of my uh my speed consultancy, my speed training and development on, on Twitter, but feel free to get in contact with me on Twitter and we can discuss things further. Um, so that's at Marlon Devonish. Aside from that, I've got a website in development, which will be out soon, which will be marlondevonish.com. And yeah, uh, they're the two major things you can get in touch with me. And uh, I'm quite, I'm on Twitter quite a bit, so feel free to get in touch. Cool. Marlon, you're an absolute legend. Cheers, mate. Thanks. So there you go, some really good insights into the work that Marlon does with Gloucester Rugby and and his other private clients. Um, I hope you enjoyed that and and got a lot out of it. Uh, In the meantime, check us out at www.rugbyrenegade.com and check us out on Facebook and Twitter. There's always stuff going on there and and Instagram. Uh, And also more podcasts on the way, Uh, some really good interviews coming up. So please subscribe to us on on whatever it is you you use for podcasts, whether it's iTunes, uh, Stitcher or SoundCloud. Get on, um, subscribe to us, follow us and uh, and give us some really good reviews as well. We much appreciate it and we'll keep these uh, awesome podcasts coming. All the best. Till next time. Thanks for listening to the Rugby Renegade Podcast. For more quality rugby strength and conditioning information, check us out at rugbyrenegade.com. Rugby Renegade, building machines.